right, here's the situation. I am now currently headed to a spot recommended to me by Jeff Waldridge, who's a Kentucky Bigfoot researcher. He has been working this area for a while. It's one of his uh, research areas, actually. He says he's had a lot of interesting, potential, aggressive sort of behavior, rock throws and that sort of stuff, growls in this area. My plan I'm, is I'm solo, so not something I usually like to do, going out in the woods at night solo. But he says he goes out here at night alone quite a bit, and that's when he has stuff happen. So I'm going to give it a try. My approach is going to be just going in walking. I'm not doing any kind of knocks or anything along those lines. Just playing it cool. I'll have uh, this camera probably rolling. Audio is going to be rolling the whole time. And I'll have the Pulsar Thermal unit. So that should be the kind of trifecta of equipment for the night. And I suppose we'll see what happens. It's about 32 degrees outside right now. Kind of late November. This is before Thanksgiving. So I suppose we shall see what happens. Once I arrived in the area, I sat in the car for about 15 minutes, with the idea of letting the area calm down again after I'd driven in. I would listen with the windows down and scan with the thermal unit. Looking back on the audio now, it does sound most like a dog, which it probably was. However, in the moment, while alone in that spot, it did sound somewhat unusual. Luckily, with the recording, I'm able to now play it back and get a better idea of what it was. Oh, it got so cold out here. So I just heard a part out and I saw it fly on the thermal. It was pretty neat. It was flying low to the ground. It seems like now animals are kind of coming out. There's that initial period of a really long silence. It's so cold that my camera battery shut down. I just switched it. The area that I sent you to, it has a lake, very large lake that people fish in and, and commonly visit, and then it's connected with a river. So uh, it has a huge wildlife management area that uh, is protected land. So um, there's all kinds of different animals there. I've encountered about anything you could imagine out there that's supposedly in Kentucky. And uh, there's plenty of food sources. The state actually grows cornfields out there that's specifically for wildlife. So um, 
they have a nice rich food source uh, there's not a lot of hunters and things they do uh, selected hunting periods which you have to do like a lottery for so it's not just you know willy-nilly out there hunting so this area has had sightings for documented for at least probably 20 years I've actually got to talk to several that at least 10 or more that that are really credible sightings I mean it's it's a hot area it's uh, and this is not from 10 years ago, I mean, there's sightings, I would say there's sightings down there that people never report. But we've had some really close sightings. There was a turkey hunter that was driving down the road to get to that area. And he said he saw one standing on the side of the road. He said that when he got closer to it, he actually was able to see its face. And he said its eyes were shining red and it had a pushed in, you know, nose. And he said it was one of the scariest things he ever saw. He didn't want to see it again, never wants to see it again. And um, the crazy part about that is probably a year before that, there was a lady that was driving down that road. She saw one probably 50 yards away, headed the same direction, same side of the road. And they, those two people didn't know each other. Now, once I started to look at it, figure out where they going toward a food source or whatever the case was, they were actually headed toward a power line cut. Because I have another sighting where a uh, lady was hearing her dogs going crazy so she walked out there and she saw this smaller one probably a juvenile and her dogs had it stuck in one of these power line cuts it was kind of you know cornered and it was hissing and growling and making noises at the dogs to try to you know it's kind of snarling showing its teeth and then she said that she called the dogs off and it's it went straight up the hill up that power line cut toward the top of the hill same direction that the other two we're crossing the road so pretty cool patterns out there i go out alone a lot for the simple fact that it makes me vulnerable and i think that um, i think that's kind of a plus when you're out there because if you have a group of people then you might be able to intimidate one if there's one here or one there but if they see you by yourself then they're going to look at it and be like i can take this guy you know he's he's no threat whatsoever and I've been knocked at. Uh, one of the incidents where I was knocked at, I was actually out there. It was starting to get dark. And I didn't mean to be out there when it was dark. It wasn't planned. So um, I'd actually uh, dropped one of my SD cards for my game camera. So I was like, finding it. And I was like, I need to get out of here before it's dark. I don't want to be in here. I didn't really have the gear for it. And then it started to get really dark. And I was like, oh, man. So I was walking through the woods and Turned off all my camera light, everything, because I film everything out there, and I heard a knock. And I think what had happened was it lost track of where I was. And it was knocking to try to get me to respond, and I didn't do it. I've been out there enough to know that uh, they will try to find where you are very, very, very easily. And one other instance, I was out there at nighttime, it was really dark, and I heard... I always stop when I'm walking through the woods to make sure you're not being trailed by normal wildlife. So I stopped and I heard two footsteps behind me. So I was like, okay, there's something behind me. So I picked up the pace a little bit. I'm never gonna run from wildlife. You're not supposed to do that. So I kept walking. I got up to the gravel road to go back toward the car and something across the, uh, probably about 100 yards away, you heard a tree fall in the woods. For people that go in the woods, that's not a common thing that happens. You don't just hear trees fall all the time. So I was like, eh, it's kind of weird coincidence that I was being followed by something here and then there's a tree over there that fell. Um, so I got to the car and um, captured all that on video. There was another instance where I took these two YouTubers out to film for their channel. And uh, you know, it's all fun and games, right? And having a good time. And then we got something very close to something very big. And you started to hear it growl. And it was growling at us. And so I had to pull my weapon. That's one of the only times I've ever pulled my weapon in the woods. Because I, we were probably 30 yards from whatever it was. And it was down low. Couldn't see what it was. It could see us, obviously. Um, and I don't know to this day what that was. So there's been some very intense situations that have took place down there. You know, I've got a game camera and I've had one down there for probably, oh, probably two years at least. And I just let it run all the time and I check it. 
And uh, this one instance, I was checking it. You get your normal deer, your normal rabbits, fox, coyote, things like that. But in this instance, there was eyes that began to peek around from behind a tree. And the weird part about it was it was almost like it got caught there. It wasn't intended to be there. And it was like, oh, and it could see the IR light. So it was very curious. So in the footage, you see it peek around a tree and you can see it blink. And then it kind of goes back and then you can see it moving around the tree and it kind of comes back again. Um, the weird part about it was we actually went and measured. So we compared it with other footage of deer. Uh, we compared it. We measured the tree of where it was, where its eyes would have been located. And its eyes was about at the six and a half to seven foot mark. So it was a very tall whatever it was. Now there have been some people that have said, well, could it have been an owl on the other side of the tree? There's nothing for it to stand on. Could it have been a squirrel? Probably not. But I will tell you the, the crazy part about it was its eyes were in the front of its head. So, uh, you know, there's, there's an old saying that goes, uh, you know, eyes in the front, they will hunt, and eyes on the side, they will hide. It's kind of a way that you kind of look at some of the predator and prey in the woods. Okay, so I'm back out here in the spot I was in last night. Obviously, I talked to Jeff today. I'm getting a feel for the area. I'm going to walk through here now that it's daylight. Uh, last night, it just, you know, having driven in here, I barely got far into the woods. The camera died. So what I think I'm going to try tonight, and based off of the conversation with Jeff, he likes to go in here alone, which he says makes him feel vulnerable, which he thinks why he has activity of sorts. Only with red lights, no infrared. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use this the Sony A7 that I'm filming this with as opposed to the handy cams that we usually use because of the night vision. So I'll just kind of have that on me just for the sake of having video and running audio. But I um, just want to kind of get a feel for the area out here in the daytime. Okay, so I'm here in the spot, exact spot I was last night. Car was parked right here, looking out on that hill. Got a hill up back above here. But that uh, weird human dog bark thing that I heard sounded like it was coming from over there. And I didn't know that hill was up there. I didn't know what this area looked like at all at night. I mean, with the thermal, you can't really see that far. Jeff thinks that things come from that hill up there. That they kind of reside up there and that there's actually, well, the river's actually right there. Okay, this is kind of interesting. So here's my car. There's a bone. It's placed right here. Now, is it possible I didn't see this last night? Perhaps, but I did. I mean, back up in this area. I feel like I would have crushed this. So that's kind of interesting. Some kind of animal bone. Not saying that's anything, but. Uh, could have been any other animal brought here, but I just think that's a little intriguing. So right here near the car, finding some canine prints. Probably coyote, I don't know that or someone's dog, but it is right near the car. Maybe they dropped that off, I don't know, the bone. But anyway. So one of the interesting points that Jeff had brought up during the interview were that this wildlife management area, I suppose like others, actually grows corn for the wildlife. So presumably deer and other species will eat this. So that seems like a good sign just in terms of food sources. Another thing I have since learned from Jeff, I knew that he said that they had filmed Monster Quest out here, would have been almost probably two decades ago at this point, but what he told me was essentially right down, down a little bit this way, he said that is where some sort of bioacoustics expert was was down there and got a rock thrown at them in this very area, and I asked him about that, I said, oh, you know, 
did you pick this area because Monster Quest had filmed here? He said no, he had actually started researching in this area and then reached out to the professor that was on the show. That's another interesting detail about this area. It's the Monster Quest Hillbilly Beast episode, I believe. Interesting, you've got debris all in the branches. Tells me that the water level has been this high before. That is, I mean, that's five, six feet, six plus feet off the ground. We cleared over here. Jeff has said this area does flood, or has. You can just see all that debris clumped up in the tree. I can see very clearly up here. I had a thermal unit, but easily see anything that was up there. So tonight we shall see if I'll be able to see anything up in there. Found myself a nice old tree to sit on. I just noticed this. being held on by fishing line, I assume. Feeling a little better now that I know the layout in the daytime. Gonna try to venture a little bit further into the woods, kinda go parallel the river again have the thermal with me. I'm gonna actually be running a camera just sort of pointed up at me uh, because it is, it's not as cold, but because it is cold, the batteries on the Sony's don't do so well. So I'm gonna run a GoPro just kind of pointed at me. I will have audio rolling and I'll be operating the thermal imager. So that'll be my, those two are my primary focuses, but the camera will be pointed at me just to get reactions if I hear anything or anything like that. Uh, it's going to be of limited visibility, so uh, kind of bear with me here. It's obviously a little bit tougher to film when it's just one person, especially at night when I'm trying to operate multiple pieces of equipment. So with that said, I'm going to try the same approach as last night where I pull in, just kind of acclimate myself to the weather a bit, roll down the window. That's pretty much the plan, so I guess we'll just have to see how it goes. a lot brighter than last night. I'm gonna walk down the river. Sound like a knock. That was pretty clear. That was extremely clear. What was to my left sounded like across the river.
scan. Just check my surroundings. The field looks clear. Everything to the car looks pretty clear. Some kind of heat signature up on that hill. Well, this is definitely making it a lot easier being able to warm up in the car. I'm trying to find the motivation to get back out there and walk down the other trail. That knock, that's the only thing I could really say that was somewhat compelling. I mean, it was pretty interesting. I was kind of hoping for some more. I mean, that knock sounded like it came from across and up towards the right. Not exactly close, but not, not terribly far, I wouldn't say. Again, comparing it to a Gunshot, distant gunshot, it didn't sound like that to me. Whatever that thing was that I was filming before I got into the car to warm up is no longer there. The large heat signature I was getting on here it almost looked double. I'm scanning the entire hill. I mean, I'm not going to say that's something, but I'm in the exact spot I was in. I almost feel like I should have kept the thermal on it and just kept it running outside. That is really weird. I just don't know how big it would be if it was that far up. I mean, I'm scanning exactly where it would have been. I'm searching everywhere. I don't see anything even close to that. I mean, that kind of gave the signature of like a rock or something, but it was it was different in shape to when I'm getting the the tops of the trees as I aim up, and it's no longer there. Well, that is that's weird. I'll put it that way. Well. I have to do a comparison. I got very close, you know, not close. I, I was focused on that object for quite a while. And now it's just not there. I mean, even if it is anything of interest, you can barely tell what it, what it was. It's just not there anymore. That's the only interesting thing about it. I wish I would have gotten footage of it walking off or how exactly it disappeared. Well, I mean, it's just brutally cold out here. I'm going to probably call it here, and maybe we can get back here and investigate with Jeff next time. And As for the thermal footage, I'm going to attempt to analyze this as best I can. The primary problem is that I wasn't able to return to this location the next day to follow up as I was heading back home for Thanksgiving. Ideally, it would be great to return with another person in order to have them climb the hill opposite where I was parked and recreate the footage entirely. But for now, we'll work with what we have. First off, obviously it's very inconclusive overall. It's basically a blob squatch, but I'm not claiming it's a Sasquatch at all. I have no clue what it is. 
Whatever this is, however, I do believe it was an animate object, as in an animal of some kind. While at first I believed it to be stationary, something like a rock near the top of the hill, it was clearly not there any longer after those 10 to 15 minutes later when I scanned the same area after getting out of the car. Two things I find intriguing about it are number one, my hearing of a pretty clear wood knock from that side of the river and general area while I was out there, and number two, the size of the heat signature given the distance, which I'll get into now. Without an exact measurement of distance made on location, I used Google Earth to attempt to figure out the distance. Judging by the footage, the distance between myself and roughly where the subject would have been was around 1100 plus feet. That's not exactly precise, given I don't know the exact location of the thermal subject, but even moving our measuring tool around, it stays consistently within 1000 to 1200 feet on the hill. The object does appear closer to the top of the hill and tree line in the video. That distance is around the size of a cruise ship, which average around a thousand feet long. That's also roughly a little more than three football field lengths, which are 300 feet long apiece. So that is a considerable distance. Here is a representation of where I would have been standing when I filmed the subject and the direction I was filming in. Looking at this wide angle shot taken from the hood of the car earlier in the day, this would have been about a foot to the right of where I stood outside of the driver's side door. Using this visual, I've attempted to roughly line up where on the hill the thermal would have been by using trees and things in the background. Of course, it's not going to be an exact match, especially with shaky handheld footage that was moving around, but it gives me a rough idea of where it might have been. Now the obvious question is what known animal could this be? In this part of central Kentucky, white-tailed deer are the largest animals in the area for the most part. There are no documented elk here, and even sightings of black bears are extremely rare. Jeff, for example, has never seen one or found sign in this area, but of course I can't exclude that because animals don't follow our rules and can show up where they want. I have doubts that a hog, coyote, or dog would show up that large as a heat signature from over a thousand feet away. Thus, white-tailed deer seems to be overall the most apt comparison. The night before, I captured footage of what appeared to be an average-sized white-tailed doe at the edge of the field in front of me. The corner of that field where the deer was standing is about 415 feet away from where I was. That's less than half the distance to the subject on the hill. When looking at the two thermals overlaid, the subject on the hill is only slightly smaller than the deer at over half that distance. It does appear bulkier than the deer as well. I find that interesting, albeit inconclusive. So there you have it. Hopefully at some point I can get back to that spot and recreate the footage as it has left me with more questions than answers. If anybody has any suggestions or theories, be sure to leave them in the comments. I genuinely enjoy seeing and responding to those left by you, the viewers. Scene 1B, shot one, take three. Hold on. Sorry. Ready? Okay, we're good. All right.